Hello everybody, my name is Tiana Coates and I am the owner of Winding Wick Candles and I make these fun handmade candles. So a few years back, I made a video called How to Start Your Candle Business and that was when I was about a year into my business and I was still working out of my home. So I wanted to make an updated video because now we are here in my candle retail shop. We have a workspace, I have an employee, I've leased a building. And we're doing a lot more stuff compared to that. So I figured I'd give you some tips and tricks and hopefully some helpful information if you're looking to start a candle business in the new year or anytime, honestly. But I have my iPad and let's get into it. Before we get on with the rest of the video, I would like to thank our sponsors today, Anna Luisa. So if you're new to Anna Luisa, they are a jewelry brand based in New York that specializes in sustainable jewelry. So what makes Anna Luisa unique from other jewelry brands is that they are sustainable and carbon neutral. So everything on the Anna Luisa website is created ethically. So they really care about the environment. They don't go out and mine for any new metals or diamonds. The diamonds are actually lab grown. So that's one thing I really like about this jewelry company. You can feel good about buying from them. So Anna Luisa uses top notch materials. So the 14 karat solid gold is not mined from the earth. It is recycled. And I really like this about them because it gives old jewelry um, a new look and it's very eco-friendly. And the sterling silver is also 100% recycled cycle so Anna Luisa makes her jewelry in small batches and that's for a couple reasons so this helps to eliminate any excess waste and it's also great for constantly updating their designs whenever you log on they're always gonna have some new stuff which is really fun and what is also great about Anna Luisa is the eco-friendly packaging whenever I get stuff shipped to me it's always very minimal um, the packaging is recyclable, which is awesome. And you can also select for reduced packaging options just in case you want to save a little bit more on the packaging, then Anna Luisa will accommodate that for you. So when you log on to their website, you're going to have a variety of pieces to browse through. They have jewelry starting as low as $39 and going up all the way to more luxury pieces. So there's something out there for everyone. Here are the Celeste earrings that I actually have a pair of and I love them. So if you guys are interested in checking out any of their pieces, you can check out their link in my description and browse around. And thanks again to Anna Luisa for sponsoring today's video. Let's get back to it. The first tip I have for you all before you even think about launching your business, your brand or whatever, is to think about your niche. Now, I know a lot of people don't think about this first and they may start to, to think about testing their candles or making your candles, but I feel like finding your niche is going to determine a lot of what you're gonna do next, like how you're gonna, what you're gonna buy or how you're going to market and all of that stuff. So to me, I would say making a candle is one thing. So you can't just say, I make candles. You have to say, I make dessert candles or find out what kind of candles and what your audience is gonna be looking for. So for me, I make dessert themed candles and you know, someone else may make luxury candles. So think about that before you even start anything because it's gonna help you a ton, I promise. Candle making is, kind of finicky so even though it seems really easy in theory to just pour some wax in the container and put a wick in there you're good to go but honestly we are selling a product that people light on fire they trust us that this is going to do what it's supposed to do give them you know the vibe they're looking for it without causing injury burning anyone's house down or anything like that so with that said there are some really great resources out there and i would say using a wick guide when you're first starting is very valuable um candlescience.com has a great wick guide as long with along with a lot of resources to help you um, start making candles and check the description down below because i'm going to leave a lot of links and also you can sign up for a newsletter um, i'm going to start getting into more of the education side now that i have help in the studio so i'm going to be doing a monthly newsletter called the monthly flame i think that's what i'm going to call it where you're going to have tips business tips candle tips all sorts of stuff so please check out resources um, so that you can make sure that your product is safe and let me tell you just know that customers do not trim their wick after making candles for years even if you test your candles they burn perfectly just know majority of your customers do not trim their wick and i feel like this is um, the fault of a lot of major um, candle brands because they don't ever tell their customers this well not that i 
a lot of people just don't know. So you go into Bath and Body Works Yankee Candle and then you buy the candle and you're never given, at least from what I've seen, I've done a couple purchases at these places and I was never given any type of little, you know, instruction paper or anything like that to let you know to trim a wick. So a lot of customers don't even know. Personally, at my retail store, I give them a little card and I even tell them at the register how to get the best burn out of the candles. So. It's not the customer's fault. I just feel like it's not something that has been talked about that much. So let's make sure that the candle burns well, even for people who don't trim their wick. So here's a little tip for you when it comes to candle testing that I've learned over the years. When you start to get into candle making, you're gonna find a lot of information and a lot of people may say, um, getting a complete melt pool the first time you burn a candle means that you're gonna have a really good candle, which is true if you trim the wick. So what I have learned to do is when you get a little bit more advanced in candle making, I find that when you get a full melt pull after four or five burns of the candle, then that really helps you slow down the, um, then that really helps because you're not going to risk someone overheating their candle even if they don't trim the wicks. Candle itself is going to get hotter and hotter, the container as the flame gets lower into the candle. So even though you get a really good burn at the top, if someone is not trimming their wick as the candle gets lower, then they have more potential of the candle cracking or actually lighting on fire. And candle wax itself can catch on fire. So this is something that happens when you don't trim the wick. So when you first burn the candle and you have you know a little bit of wax left on the side, don't worry about it. Keep on testing and testing. And if you get about halfway to the candle, you might start to see the candle cleaning up on the edges. And this means your candle is actually gonna burn really, really good, even if someone doesn't trim their wig. So that's kind of what I've been testing out and it's really hard to achieve that. Um, so I would say that's more when you get into the advanced stages. If you can get your candle to do that, it would be really, really helpful. So we talked about candle safety and all of that. Now that we've gotten that out the way, we're gonna talk more business logistics now. So when I talk about this, I'm talking about insurance, product costs, budget, and things you need to think about when you are first starting a business. So we just talked about safety, so let's actually talk about candle insurance. So there is a difference between general liability and product liability insurance. Now when you go looking for quotes and you type candle insurance, you're gonna see a lot of companies pop up. And this is kind of tricky because a lot of those companies, majority of those companies that pop up, they cover your candle business as far as general liability goes. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, general liability um, is insurance you're gonna need for if you're selling in person, or um, let's say you do a pop-up shop or something like that, or a farmer's market and you pop up a little booth, then you're gonna want general liability in case someone trips in your booth and they get hurt or something like that. Or if you have a retail store, if someone slips and falls, that's what general liability is covered for. So if you ever reach out to a insurance company and you say, hey, is my candle business covered? They might just say, yeah, it's covered. We have this general liability policy. But what you didn't say is, do you have product liability insurance for my candles? That's how you need to phrase it because a lot of them won't tell you, they won't, um, especially if you're not, if you don't know the difference, um, they, it, it's a little bit deceiving. So just know that for your actual candle product, you're gonna need product liability insurance and there are very little companies that I know of that offer product liability insurance for candles that a small business owner um, can just sign up for. So product liability insurance is gonna cover if the candle catches on fire, and that's what we're most worried about, right? So general liability isn't really gonna help you in that area. So product liability is gonna cover if you make a mistake and the candle catches on fire or if the customer mishandles the candle. And yes, even if it's the customer's fault, you still need insurance because if the customer decides to pursue it and sue you, even if it's their fault, you still have to cover all of those costs. So you need product liability insurance to cover you for that. So I'm gonna leave links down below. Personally, I have Indie Business Network for product liability for my products. Um, even when you sign up for some wholesale platforms, they they require you to have product liability insurance on every single product, even if it's not candles. Um, 
generally any product that you sell needs to have insurance attached to it. So uh, yeah, I have Indie Business Network for product liability and I also have them for general liability and professional liability since I do teach information online. I wanna make sure I'm covered so that no one says that I taught something and made their house blow up and try to sue me over that. So those are the policies that I have at the moment and you can check them out. And also Soapmakers Guild offers product liability insurance for candles as well. Now talking about insurance, we're gonna talk more about putting things in your candles. Like I know I talked about having a niche. So some people like crystal candles, flower candles. I've seen people put all sorts of things inside of candles. Now, if you look at the big candle companies, Yankee Candles, Bath and Body Works, do they put anything inside of their candles besides wax? I haven't seen it. And there may be a reason why to this. Now, when we talk about insurance purposes, a lot of these insurance you know, companies, they're gonna cover your candle, but once you start putting more things in there that aren't wax, you don't know if that's covered or not. So let's say you have a crystal candle and you've tested it, it works great, you've never had any problems with it, that's great and dandy, but putting those crystals in your candle, make sure your insurance covers that before you do that. Personally, I don't put anything in my candles that isn't wax. Um, I do put some eco glitter in the candles, but for the most part, it's all wax. Everything in there is wax. I don't put rocks, flowers, or anything in the candles for that purposes. For that purpose. <laughs> all right, so we talked about insurance. Let's also talk about the cost. So I'm going to put a video up here because we're not going to get into the cost of everything to start up your candle business because then this would be for a really long video, but I want to highlight product cost. So making sure the products that you're buying, the containers and all of that are going to you know, be within your budget. So remember we talked about finding a niche. So now you're going to start buying things that kind of coincide with that niche. So you really want to make sure you're breaking down each and every cost that goes into your product down to the packing peanuts, the tissue paper, the wax melt samples, everything that goes into that product. So when we talked about the niche, again, I know concrete candles are very popular, popular, but concrete is very heavy. So when you start making these concrete products, you're going to have to think about the shipping cost. So now you may have to charge a little bit more for your candle. Um, so you really have to think about that as you are creating your product. So maybe you thought of, hmm, maybe my niche is going to be concrete candles and you get down to budgeting all the costs and shipping and how much that's going to weigh. Then you're like, oh, that's actually expensive. All right, so make sure you set a budget also because you, like I said, um, a lot of people tend to go overboard on packaging and putting all sorts of flyers and candy and treats. Customers don't care about candy, honestly. They might, might like a freebie, especially when you're doing candles. Um, a lot of people like to have a free wax sample. So try to make sure you are thinking about those costs and the costs um, of packaging those little samples into the bag and try to make it as cost efficient at, or cost efficient as cost efficient. <laughs> All right, another thing that I'm gonna talk about with business logistics, I guess it kind of fits in this category is avoiding copyright infr infringement. And I feel like this happens a lot, especially with new business owners who are not super aware of copyright and how that works. So when you log on to Etsy, you probably see a lot of people selling um, trademark products. So then you have an idea for a trademark product, let's say Harry Potter, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can make these Harry Potter candles. And my whole business is going to be centered around different Harry Potter characters, themes, whatever and it's gonna be great. And that sounds great in theory, and it sounds really cool, but you may not know that you are infringing on copyright. So just because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean that it's okay. So if you ever have questions about copyright, you can visit the USPTO, which I'll link down below. So you can see what's trademarked. If you have any questions, if you have doubts, you can actually look that stuff up. So the best practice is to be unique. If you are inspired by a fandom, um, so for me personally, I do have a Harry Potter 
fandom candle, but nothing about it is Harry Potter. The artwork, the name, nothing. And I actually did look up the trademark because it's called the Sorting Candle. So a mistake that I did back early on in my candle making days was I called it the Sorting Hat Candle. So the Sorting Hat is actually trademarked and I got popped for that on Amazon. So on Etsy, I never received anything about it because Etsy, I mean, they don't have the power to police everything. It's just a lot of people on there selling copyright items. So I never got in trouble. But once I moved into Amazon, then I got in trouble right away within like the first week of me putting that candle up there. So for me, I have to call it wizard candle, magic candle, something like that. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you would know exactly what it was when you saw it, but um, you just can't use the name. So I hope that clears it up for you guys because what would really stink, and I've seen people do this before, they base their whole business off of something that's copyright and they have no idea. For example, Harry Potter or especially Disney. And they start making all these sales because of course it's it's um, popular because people it's a product it's a character that people already relate to so you don't have to sell them on harry potter or um, cinderella or anything like that because they already know it so you end up doing crazy amounts of sales people love it and then you get in trouble for it and then if all of your products are copyright it's gonna really hurt your business to have to change everything. It's gonna hurt you, especially if maybe you invested in a team or something like that around these products. It's going to hurt your business. And I think I have a customer, so I'm gonna turn this off really quick, you guys. Okay, you guys, I'm back. I had to help a customer. I'm trying to multitask here and film this. Um, but let's get back to business. All right, so I think where we left off, we're gonna talk more about business plans and why that's kind of important in the beginning stages. Now, I had no idea what a business plan was and I didn't learn about them until I started attending like um, seminars, I guess. Is that what they're called? <laughs> Entrepreneur seminars and workshops. I learned more about business plans and how those can really help you in the long run. So what business plans do essentially is just to help you set goals so that you know where you're going. I know especially for me, um, sometimes I just kind of get shiny object syndrome and I'll think of something and I'll start doing it right away. But sometimes it's best to just wait on things like, for instance, if you have an idea but you're like, you know what, everything's not aligned right now for that specific idea. Um, let me just put that on hold and then we will, you know, put that in the plan and then we'll just do baby steps until we get there. And when we hit, when we hit a certain point, now we can act on that idea. Because sometimes if you find yourself doing too much, you know, you may be wasting time. So it feels like you're always busy, but you're never getting anything done. Now, if you start doing more goals and planning, that can help you kind of eliminate that or not really eliminate because I still do it, but even you'll have less of that at least and you'll have a plan. So with that said, let's talk a little bit about marketing. And I know marketing can be super hard, especially with candle businesses, because in 2020, candle businesses exploded and it was extremely hard to kind of not only get supplies and get, get started, but um, now you have a lot more people making candles and a lot more competition. So with marketing, do not just rely on going viral on TikTok. Sometimes that's people's like only marketing. They're like, well, I'll just make candles and then we'll go viral. And even if you do go viral on TikTok, um, I've seen this happen before. People will have viral videos and then they'll post, you know, a video a month from now. And they're like, well, I went viral once and I thought I was, you know, doing da da da. And now no one's looking at my videos. Now, getting customers is... A hard thing and getting return customers this is a long time process you have to build relationships remember nobody owes you a sale you have to get out there and you have to build the relationship and get people excited about what you have and you have to connect with people tell your story and get them and gain their trust so that's your job now with everything that people have for sale on the internet people can spend their money in a million different places so it's really hard to get customers and to me like having a viral video is cool but i don't rely on viral media viral videos or even though i do use social media regu regularly it's a consistent thing like 
um, YouTube took me a year of creating content consistently before anyone even started watching it. So once you start getting out there and doing the whole marketing thing, you could have the best product in the world, but if you're not consistent with whatever you decide to go with as far as your marketing, then it's gonna be really hard and you have to do other have other avenues for marketing besides just, you know, TikTok. A big one that a lot of people don't really think about is email lists and email lists do cost money. So I know you hear, you may hear a lot of people say, start an email list, do that, do that, but they don't tell you that they cost money. So this was something that I ran into when I started building my email list. I have over 15,000 email subscribers now in total and emails cost money <laughs> it costs about 150 bucks a month just to have that many email subscribers and of course when you have email subscribers you have to actually send emails which is something that i have a horrible time with so i am starting my email newsletter thing and hopefully in the next year i can get better and better using my emails because i am just throwing money out the door with all of these subscribers and all of that and don't be afraid to lose subscribers because Email subscribers, like I said, they cost money. So if you're sending out emails and people unsubscribe, let them unsubscribe because you don't wanna to pay to have someone on your email list when they're not gonna even buy the product or they're not interested. So don't be afraid of people unsubscribing from your email list because you want your targeted, targeted customers, you want to target the customers who are actually gonna buy your product. So another thing about um, marketing is customer service and keeping your products fresh and always having new things. This is one that I'm working out, working on is always having new products, new things going on. So how are you going to connect with them again? Email marketing, showing up consistently and providing good customer service, meaning that if you have a viral video, don't take orders and say, well, um, 10,000 people ordered, so you're gonna have to wait three months. They're never gonna buy from you again. So I have had a viral video on TikTok a couple of times, and what I do is I take enough orders that I can fill in a week. So if I have to cut off orders, I have to cut them off because you want those people that ordered with you within that time frame to come back and spend more money eventually. And if they have to wait three months just to get the thing, they may be turned off to come back from you. So I remember one of my biggest customers actually came from one of these videos and she is now my biggest customer. She orders everything that I put out and you know, providing good customer service, fixing any issues, uh, making sure that stuff ships out quick and it's quality, okay? So going viral isn't necessarily the best thing that is ever gonna happen to you. It can be a really cool thing, but just make sure you're doing it responsibly, I guess. Um, I always like to mention um, the story from Shay Bakery that she shared on her Instagram, um, and it's public, so I am not, I always like to say it's public information, so I'm not trying to shame her or anything, because she, it was really awesome that she shared the story, because it's a great lesson, um, because she said that she went viral, and she took all these orders, and she hired all these people, and she did all this stuff really quick, and it almost tanked her business, because you're hiring all these people who are not, trained to create the product to your standards who people who don't care about your business honestly and you know she lost hundreds of orders somehow people were upset people were asking for the money back a lot of chargebacks so going big really quick can hurt your business if you're not prepared so slow and steady don't be afraid to cut off the orders if you can't handle it um but you also want to make sure you are connecting with that audience over and over and over again so that they come back. So that is kind of like marketing is a long-term thing. Don't expect people to buy from you the first time they see you. It's going to take a long time to build that relationship with them um, before they spend their hard-earned money with you. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is organization. And for me... I like organizing things, I like systems. So I decided to really get things organized when I kept ordering the same fragrance oils oils over and over and over because I didn't know they were on my shelf. So that's when I started investing in Crafty Base. I love using Crafty Base, honestly. It keeps me so organized. And for my fragrance oils, I have them um, organized by row and bin so I can locate a fragrance if it's in, you know, the software will tell me, oh, the, I don't know, cocoa fragrance is in 
B3. So I can go to that bin, pull the fragrance, and even in Crafty Base, if we are you know, keeping track like we should, it'll tell me how much fragrance I have left, if I need to reorder it, and it just saves you so much money. Even though you are investing in the software, you'll be saving a lot of money in the long run in material costs and in headaches, and it'll streamline your time because you won't be wasting time doing something and looking for something. So getting organized is huge. It can save you a lot of time and money in the long run. So Crafty Base is great for that. I keep my recipes. Um, and with my employee, it's easy for us to work together. So once you start hiring people, um, you want to have systems because you may be used to you doing everything and you know where everything is and you know the recipes. But in Crafty Base, he has the recipes there. Um, he can write in any special notes if he needs help with you know a certain recipe he can put reminders for himself he can um, make the candles without having to ask me a million questions basically and it just helps us both so it's just really organized and plus when you have employees you want things to be as streamlined and organized as possible for them so that when they come into work it's not a tornado and they're not running around crazy like have you ever had a job where it just wasn't organized and then you and your coworkers are just like always discombobulated the whole time so whenever you are you know working your business try to keep track of your pain points and then see how you can organize that so just a tip there also when it comes to other things like supply reorder or communication uh, making sure you have some type of way uh, to communicate or you know even if you're by yourself you may forget like oh I have to order Wix you can't just remember that you have to write it down somewhere so I use ClickUp and I have a um, area where we put supplies so if he is about to run out of wax or dye he'll put that in ClickUp and then when I go to place my order I can see it right there um, and you know we can communicate back and forth through channels like that it makes it just a lot easier you guys so once you kind of start getting a hold on your business once you're like okay we're you know we're taking this serious let's start getting more organized you should really think about organizing your supplies and your systems and not only that oh i thought i had a customer so not only that <laughs> As a handmade business owner, you are going to have to report your cost of goods sold and you're going to need that information for tax purposes. So if you are just buying things and not keeping track, it's going to really bite you in the butt when it comes to doing your taxes. So with that said, also keep separate bank accounts. As soon as you start, as soon as you start, it's going to help you a million percent if you have separate bank accounts. So for me, I use um, Novo Bank. And it's an online only bank, so there are some cons to it. There are no branches. Depositing like actual cash is kind of annoying because um, there are no branches, no ATMs. But I have always found some type of workaround to do what I need to do without any fees. So it works for me. If you do some other big name banks, I think they typically, if you do a business bank account, they have fees, monthly fees or they have requirements of how much you gotta keep in the bank to avoid fees. Um, with Novo Bank, there are no additional fees. And I know as a business owner, there are so many freaking fees. So it's always nice to kind of find something that doesn't have any fees, um, but it works for me. So I will leave that one down below for you as well. Okay, so we've talked about quite a few things. You're making your candles, testing them, insurance, all of that. Now we're gonna talk about what are you gonna expect in this first year of business. So starting a business is not a get rich quick thing at all. Um, some people think, well, I get emails all the time where people are like, I've been doing this for six months and nobody's buying my products and guess what? They probably won't be buying your products for another six months, another year. So it's very slow and steady. Like I said, you really have to build trust with the audience. Of course, when there are a million other candles, when they can go to Bath and Body Works, why would they buy your candle? So you have to really understand that and figure out how you can um, connect with the audience. And I always say using search engine optimization, I feel like it's not talked about enough um, because even without a following, you can still use keywords and search to create products that people are looking for. So when you're starting a business, a lot of people wanna say, okay, I'm gonna start my Shopify store. And that's where they go first. They go to Shopify, start at their store. But do you have traffic? How are you driving traffic to the store? Do you have a following already? Do you have, um, 
you know, people that are already shopping with you. If you don't, you're gonna have a really hard time sending traffic to that store. You're either gonna have to go viral for some reason, or you're gonna have to pay for ads to get traffic to that store. So, so many people always talk about how Etsy has so many fees and how they don't make any money there, but surprise, there are fees everywhere. And Etsy is actually a really great place to start because even with a zero following on social media, you can make sales there if you know how to do it correctly. So if you use third-party tools like E-Rank and you find out what people are searching for, you will see the craziest things. Like you will find keywords that you would have never thought of before. Like, oh, people are searching for this type of candle. I would have never thought of that. Or what is this? Why are people searching for this? So for instance, um, gingerbread candle does good every year for me for Christmas. Um, and the reason I did gingerbread is not because it's Christmas. It's because when I first started doing the gingerbread candle, it was something people were searching for. And there wasn't a lot of competition at the time. Um, and Etsy is kind of, it does take some time to figure out how the search works and how to title your things. And, and it takes time to figure out how to create a good listing that's going to get sales, but it's totally possible with zero social media following. So it's good to start on Etsy while you're building your following. And when you find that you are sending more traffic to that store than Etsy, so maybe you have built your following, you've got you know, quite a few people interested and you're sending a whole bunch of traffic to Etsy, now you can say, well, if I'm sending majority of the traffic here, I'm going to start my Shopify store now. And then you start your Shopify store, but don't close your Etsy store. You can still have it open and still use that search engine optimization to your advantage, but now you're going to send people to your Shopify store. So instead of advertising, oh, well, here's my Etsy link, just send them your Shopify link, keep your Etsy open, and now you're getting sales in both places. If you find that you're not getting enough money after the fees, that means your product isn't priced well enough and you really need to reevaluate your product pricing because I'm telling you, once you grow your business, you're gonna have way more fees than what Etsy is throwing at you. So in the first year of business also, don't be afraid to pivot, don't be afraid to change things up. While you're learning more things about the product, you're probably gonna want to observe what people are saying. So if you're finding that you're getting reviews saying there's no scent throw, then what do you need to do to figure that out and change that? Um, don't get defensive about feedback because feedback can help you improve the product. So in the first year of business, I know it can be really draining also, and sometimes you can feel lonely. You can feel like there's nobody out there to answer your questions. You may not have a lot of people around you who've started businesses. If you have, that's really awesome because you have someone to talk to. But for the most part, there are a lot of people who start businesses and they have nobody to turn to to help them with their questions, their concerns, and all of that stuff. So I know sometimes it can feel really overwhelming. It can feel like you are in a hamster wheel or you're doing a whole bunch of work and you're not seeing a return. And that is normal. And just see it as this way, when you're starting your business and all of that's a learning process. You are learning new skills you have never learned before. You're learning how to build websites. You're learning financial things. You're learning um, how to create systems. You are learning a crazy amount of things at once. And this is kind of like that stage where you're just getting everything together. So don't think of the first year of your business as, well, this is um, supposed to make me a millionaire. I'm supposed to retire. I'm supposed to quit my day job after a year. It's not going to happen like that, honestly. It took me about three years um, before I was able to quit my job. And I set a goal, like I mentioned earlier, setting goals, set a goal. And I had a list of things I needed to do before I quit that job. And I had to um, slowly tackle each each step of that list before I was like, okay, I have a health insurance. I have my six months of, you know, um, uh, money in the bank as a cushion while I take this thing full time and when I am taking this full thing full time This is what I need to do in those six months So it took me three years to actually get to the point where I could you know take the next step So it's a slow process you guys don't feel like you know what you see on social media when people do go viral That's very rare. Not a lot of people do that so um, just slow and steady and don't feel like you have to um, conquer the world in your first year of business. All right, so we talked about our first year of business. Now you're just kind of getting everything together. So let's say you're at the point where you have quit your full-time job. 
and maybe it's been three years at this point and you're like okay i'm at the point where i am ready to move to the next step and you need to hire people so i have hired people and it is actually extremely hard and it sounds easy in theory to say well when i start doing this and this and this i'm just gonna hire people yeah <laughs> but you have to train those people so this whole time you're probably just doing things autonomously you are so used to doing things on your own you know exactly how to do it and you've never thought about writing it down you've never given second thought because you're so used to it at this point now when you hire someone they have probably never made a candle in their life and you have to now show them not only how to make a candle but in my case how to make these candles and how to make them how i would make them and that is actually a really difficult thing to do because you're teaching a brand new person how to do that so my candle maker he's been with me for about three months and he's to the point where he can make the candle um, at the same level that i can make it and it was um Honestly, I had to give him three months time to get to that point. So you have to set realistic expectations. So when you are hiring someone, be prepared to be like, okay, for the for this period, for 90 days, I'm gonna have to pay this person to learn how to do something. And that can cost a lot of money. So you have to make sure you hire with intention and then you have to make sure you're organized. So before you even hire anybody, you have to have those systems organized like we talked about earlier. You have to have your um, financial setup. So your QuickBooks, you know, and you have to make sure your numbers are good and you have to um, have your system so your crafty base your recipes your um, all your organization and you are probably the only person doing this and it's very difficult to do all of that on your own plus make the candles plus do everything else um, so it's really important to have like a plan and to keep maybe a planner or some way to kind of organize your life so that you can do all of these things without burning yourself out it takes time so what we did we had a one month two month three month goals so that he knew exactly where he should be at and you have to make sure you're providing um, you know a nice workspace so you have to make sure they're comfortable make sure they have their materials and proper working equipment and so that they can do the job to the best of their abilities without feeling stressed out because you want your employees to be happy while they're working with you so it's definitely a learning curve having employees um, and it's not as easy as it seems especially when you're creating handmade products so that is one thing to note too and you want to pay a fair wage you want to pay them decent you don't want to pay them minimum wage and expect um, you know these crazy results while paying them a minimum wage so you have to take account for that um, but he's been doing really well honestly and we've been able to get our Walmart shipments and Amazon shipments and now I'm able to work more on content and the back end so one accomplishment that we've done since he started working we got one of our candles on page one of Amazon when you type in handmade wait no when you type in dessert candles um, it's on page one it, and I don't know by the time this video if it's still going to be there, but I was really happy to see that. And our candle is now starting to sell more on Amazon because the ranking is going up and up and up. And we're able to keep that candle in stock because now I'm not doing a million different things. So all of that three month period, I had to make sure I was keeping track of this progress so that we would start to hit our goals. Hopefully that helps you guys with some information on how to get started with a candle business in the new year and to grow your candle business. Of course, please sign up for the email list where I will send even more tips out to you guys every month. Um, so whenever I'm doing any workshops or anything, that's going to be in that email as well. But anyways, thank you guys and bye.